All right, thanks Lance. Woo. I'm louder than a firework right now. <clears throat> no, Lance is definitely right. Um, that resource table isn't just for the people that are struggling through something, it's for everybody that is in this building right now. The New Testament says that we need to be ready for in season and out of season to uh, give reproof, right? And that right there is how we get in the word. If you have nowhere to go or nowhere, or don't know how to start, you start right there in that back corner. Pick up a resource, uh, pick up, there's a 31 day devotional you can go through. Even if you're not going through it, go through it. Okay, even if even if you're not going through some suffering or whatever that trial may be, pick it up, go through it um, because you may or may somebody around you might be going through it. So it's a great resource. Um, and thanks, Lance, for talking about it. But today we're in Mark chapter seven. <clears throat> My voice is a little hoarse. And so I'm going to take a couple sips of water here. Um, but. Correction of the defiled is today's title for the sermon. But before we get into that, um, a little bit about me is that I used to work in the water industry. And people always ask me when I first came up to Milwaukee is, what do you do for work? And the hardest thing I ever have done <laughs> as soon as I moved up here is trying to explain what I did <laughs> for work. Um, it was so complicated to explain. And in the end of it, I just told people do you really care <laughs> do you really care what I what I do for work um, but today today I'm gonna try to explain it for you guys um, well I used to work in the water industry and I worked at commercial industrial sites sites such as power plants peaker plants, oil refineries, um, and manufacturing plants that required highly purified water to produce their said product does that make sense you walk in with me? Heads not in or no? Okay, all right. So my former company would come in and set up these big trailers, water purity trailers is what they were called, and they had three to four big thousand gallon a minute, a water a minute, um, vessels on them that the, the unpurified water would go through these trailers to get purified. Now in these vessels, each vessel, there was 84 to 164 membrane resin filters, okay? So you got the trailer, you got the vessel, and then in the vessel, there's these tubes that hold membranes that the water runs through. You with me? Okay, so for months, for months, these trailers would sit here and run water for our customers. Oh, 24 hours, nonstop. And these filters have to be changed. All 84 of them, or if it was a bigger vessel, 164 of them. And that was a daily occurrence for me. That's where I came in. I came in to change out the filters, each one, pulling them out. No matter the weather, no matter if it's negative 30 outside or 150 degrees, the filters need to be changed out so the customer can get water. I'd come in and we'd change out, we'd shut down the trailer, we'd shut down the water, We'd open up these tubes that have been sitting there for months, running dirty water through them. And let me tell you, the grossest smell that you could ever smell in your life, take that times 100. That's what these tubes smell like. It was awful. And we had to pull each membrane out one by one. Um, they were probably weighed 150 pounds soaking wet. You would get soaked. You would get covered with slime and gross, you don't know, okay, there was an oil refinery um, in Lamont, Illinois, and you have no idea what they pulled out, that, uh, out of that river. It's disgusting. And it would be in these tubes, it would get it all over you. You were defiled, let me just tell you that. <laughs> um, you would get soaked, you would smell like dead fish. Um, Bella can attest to that, shout out to her. I don't know where she went, but <laughs> she did my laundry. That girl is a champion, okay? Uh, but what I would do is that I would come home from work, I would strip in the garage, wife's orders, okay? And I would run to the shower, okay? I was that gross. If you want to talk about defilement, impurity, and just disgusting on a daily basis, it was me, okay? But let me tell you, 
Those were the best showers of my life. <laughs> they really were. And you're probably maybe even sitting there and you're like, Ross, I still have no clue what you did for work, but that's okay. Bear with me. All that being said, I was really, really, really dirty. And those showers washed me clean. But what does my defilement and the many times I came home smelling like a garbage can have to do with Mark chapter 7? Well, today, as we look at chapter 7 of Mark, we'll see that Jesus' correction of, uh, of a defiled person. And is what they do on the outside what defiles them? Or is it something deeper? And how does the Son of God, who created the heavens and the earth, and in whom all things were formed, how does he correct this defilement? Well, we're going to find out before I get ahead of myself. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. I pray that as we open up your word, I pray that we would trust that it never returns void. That we would know that you have, are the alpha and the omega and the beginning and the end. And that you would help this humble church to grow in maturity, to trust you, to follow after you, to disciple each other closer to you as you are the source of all things good. Go before me this morning, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles to turn to Mark chapter 7, we have a lot to cover today, and we're going to start in verse 1. Ready? No. You ain't ready yet. Are you all ready? Yes. No. All right, let's get it. Verse 1 of chapter 7 says this. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled. That is unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands. What's that word there? Properly. Holding to the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he, Jesus, said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this, people's, or this, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines of the commandments of men. You leave the commandments of God and hold to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and who reviles, uh, whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me, it is Corban, that is, given to God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand that there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. And from there he rose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. 
And he entered a house that did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately, there's our famous word in Mark, a woman who, whose uh, little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs on their table need, um, eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child laying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon and the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his finger into his ear and after spitting, touched his tongue and looked up at the heaven and he sighed and said, Ephrathatha, that is to be opened. And his ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. There's a lot there. But the main idea that I want you to walk away with from this morning is this. Trust in Christ's authority to correct defilement. Let me say that again. Trust in Christ's authority to correct defilement. Because in this uh, chapter 7 of Mark, Jesus corrects three things. He corrects the first thing. Jesus corrected defiled teachings and commandments. This is verses 1 through 13. We picked up with this chapter right after Jesus heals the sick. Jesse covered that last week in Gesenerat. And when the, uh, the Pharisees, they actually heard of this and they came to him. Jesus is in Galilee. The Pharisees came from Jerusalem. So they traveled to go see him. They traveled to confront him. It says that the Pharisees saw that they ate with their hands that were not ceremonially washed. And a little bit about Jewish culture, y'all, um, and really Jewish law, is that cleanliness is of great priority. Great priority. There were many great diseases in that time that would wreck a lot of people if people weren't clean. Um, they didn't have modern medicines and stuff like that. Um, so God set forth rituals for cleaning to set the nation of Israel apart from other countries with pagan cons that didn't do that. Why do you do that? So that Israel could be set apart. So Israel would be a representation of God amidst a world that doesn't, doesn't love cleanliness. The problem is not that God set forth these laws. The problem, it lies in the fact that the leaders of Israel would take these laws and manipulate them to cast people out, to take advantage of people and proclaim that if you do not know these things and if you do not do these things, then God is not pleased with you. And it says that they saw the disciples eat with their hands that were defiled in verse 2. This got the Pharisees riled up. This got them ready to go. Something was about to throw down. The Pharisees were holding up their own external traditions created by men and holding that on par with the laws of God. Saying that if you do not follow the laws of man, you are not following the laws of God. They were holding it on par with each other. If you do not hold these externalistic rituals, you break the laws of God. Even though that throughout the Old Testament and the Pentateuch and the Torah, what really pleases God is not an exercise of his law perfectly. That's not what pleases God at all. What pleases God 
is a heart that sincerely loves him, that relies on him, that has faith in him. And by doing so, the Spirit of God will well up in the person who does that to obey him. Check it. Deuteronomy 10, Deuteronomy 11, Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 16, throughout the whole Pentateuch and Torah, you can go look at it for yourself. It's right there. What pleases the Lord and what is an um, acceptable offering is a heart that is broken and contrite before him. But Mark here in verses 1 through 4 is laying out the traditions of these men that they put into place and, and saying that these, they, these were quite external obligations that you had to do. They, there was a t big to-do list that really promoted self-righteousness. Look at verse 3 and 4. He says, and Mark, it's so funny, he puts it here in, in quotations, you know, and saying that he just lists out this huge to-do list of all the things that they got to wash. Look at verse 3. He says, for the Pharisees and all the Jewish do not eat, they don't even eat, until they wash their hands properly. There was a certain way they do it. You can go look it up yourself. It's pretty extensive. Holding to the traditions of the elders, and look at this. Even when they go out to the marketplace, even when they go out to the marketplace to buy whatever, when they come back, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups, pots, copper vessels, and, and dining couches. Okay? It's a pretty extensive to-do list. So the Pharisees question the Son of God in verse 5, saying, Why do your disciples eat with unwashed hands or defiled hands? And Jesus' answer here is absolutely perfect. And it goes to show his authority over this situation. Really, every situation. <clears throat> he quotes Isaiah. Isaiah, and it says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines of the commandments of men. Now, back in Isaiah's day with Israel, Isaiah did the exact same thing. He called the leaders of Israel back to the word of God to honor them with their whole self, with their whole heart, calling out the religious leaders for looking wholly on the outside, yet they're corrupt and unrepentant at the heart. This is a verse that the Pharisees in this time with Jesus would have understood. They would have known this exact verse and know the weight behind it. And Jesus puts a stamp here saying that you leave the commandments of God and hold to the traditions of men. Even if you don't even understand the verse that I just quoted you, this is what you're doing. You're leaving the commandments of God and holding fast to the traditions of men. Yet he doesn't even stop there. These guys, these Pharisees, traveled from Jerusalem to Galilee to pick a fight with Jesus, and Jesus is like, all right, you wanted it, you're going to get it. He continues on, and he says, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your traditions. There's an explanation point on the end of that. Christ goes on in verses 9 through 12 to continue to illustrate this even further. Um, <clears throat> to prove that they reject the things of God for their own faux holy whitewashed tombed appearance. He uses um, to honor your father and mother. Um, <clears throat> we all know this. I feel like, uh, you know, the law to honor your father and mother is one that generally everybody knows. I mean, as soon as I came out the womb, it was like, boom, honor your mama and daddy. Okay, like th that was like, that was rule number one, you know. Um, and it's the same in Christ's time. Like, everybody would have known this. The law of God says that honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. That is an important thing to do. But he's using this as an illustration 
to show that they took this law from the Lord to manipulate it for their own gain. What they did, it says, uh, you know, whoever in verse 10, whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin that is given to God. So we have to understand this a little bit. The law of the Lord is set in stone to care for your parents. They have given you their time, a lot of their money, their efforts. And, you know, to honor them is to take care of them. Especially in their old age, right? So what the um, Pharisees did is, okay, instead of honoring your father and mother who are in old age, instead of giving them your time, your money, your possessions, and making sure that they are cared for, I'm going to negate that, and I'm just going to give it all to the Lord. That's what the Pharisees were promoting. And you're like, wow, that's, that seems pretty good. It seems good on the outside, but look at what Christ says right here in verse 12. If you do this, then you are no longer permitting him to do anything for his father and mother. I'm going to give everything I have to the Lord and leave my parents in the dust. And what does Christ say that does? Look at verse 13. What does that do? Come on, y'all. Come on. What's it do? What's that, Cindy? Void. It makes the word of God void. It makes void the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down and many such things you do. The Pharisees are saying, okay, this is what the Lord says. We're going to add this on top of that and say that it's okay. And instead of caring for your parents, you're going to take your time, your money, your everything, and give it to the Lord and his leaders instead of caring for those that the Lord has placed in your life. And it's okay to do that because you give it to the Lord. That uh, working of, like, that outworking of uh, the law, according to the Pharisees, creates self-righteousness. That I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing everything I can for the Lord, even while though my parents are suffering. And this is what Christ puts a stamp on to close out this rebuke in verses 12 through 13, saying that by doing this, you make the word of God void by your own traditions. You are not longing to care for or honor your mother and father when you do this. You are looking like you're doing the good thing on the outside, but you are negating the law of God on the inside. You are a hypocrite. Jesus came to correct this. He came to correct this thinking. He came to correct the defiled teachings and commandments of the Pharisees. He came to restore back the people to a salvation that is based not upon works, but upon faith. You know, when I was reading this over the past couple weeks, there's a lot in here. And when I first read it, I was like, oh, man, if I was there, I would side with Christ. I feel like I'd imagine I'd like jump on his back and point my finger at the Pharisees and see, you got it all wrong, you dummies. You know, how can you not get it? How can you not understand But in reality, how many times do I put on a safe face to look good while on the inside I'm corrupt? How many times do I show up to church and act like I'm good when my life is falling apart? When I don't acknowledge that there is sin that needs to be dealt with? In the reality, we're the Pharisees in this story. If you don't think that this hearts to look good and not repent of your sin is only for the church of Israel, you're wrong. Because it's in the DNA of our life. 
We like to put on a face for church and for others, and we don't allow the opportunity to be open, vulnerable, and repentant before the, before the Lord, bearing the weight of our sin, casting it at his feet, knowing full well he is there to save. He is there to restore. He is there to correct. And what's so beautiful is that your sin, your suffering, your trials gives you the right to come to him to lay before the throne. It gives you the opportunity to do that. If we are going to grow in maturity as a church, I'm not talking about numbers. I'm not talking about getting more people through the door. If we are going to grow in maturity as disciples of the Lord, it has to be on the gospel. It can't be by showing up here on Sunday saying, I'm going to do better. I'm going to be greater. I'm going to do the best I can, even though that my life is falling apart behind the scenes. That's not how you grow. That's not how you make disciples. It has to be founded on Christ. It has to be, church. Because we need to trust that Christ's authority, Christ's authority in correcting defilement. That's why he came. You know, I know that there's a lot of suffering going on in this body right now. I know that there is sin. I know that there is pain. I know that there are trials going on. I cannot be the only one, but the answer is not to save face and do better, but it is to cast yourself at the feet of the Savior, acknowledging that he is the only one that can correct you. He is the only one that can restore your marriage. He is the only one that can awaken the spirit inside of you to pursue him. And man, man, it's a privilege to do it together, church. Man, it's a privilege to do it together. I wouldn't want to do it without y'all. And I praise the Lord that he's given us a body to do it together. <clears throat> to bring each other into the fold of your life to pursue Christ. And we're going we're gonna to really look <laughs> at what that looks like in the, in the uh, second half of, of this chapter, but trust in Christ's authority to correct defilement. Don't save face, okay? Pursue him. Jesus came to correct defiled teachings and commandments. Point number two, Jesus came to correct defiled understanding of depravity. This is where, okay, Jesus is setting stones to make a point here. First, he acknowledged that there's some wrong teaching going on. Second, he's about to tell you what is right. Not what you put in your body makes you defiled. You are defiled. Okay? He's setting the road straight. This is the truth. He says, He called all the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. Hear and understand. That there is nothing outside of a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person, the things that come out of a person is what defiles him. <clears throat> There's nothing outside a person that can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Verse 15, his disciples are, are his disciples ask Christ personally what the parable meant and if i were in christ's shoes man i would not have the patience that he has with these fellers at all like um his patience is way more superior to mine they've been following him for a year and a half almost two years at this point and they're going lord what are you talking about and he's like you are also without understanding but he gently and calmly teaches them the right way to think. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things, evil things, come from within, and they defile 
a person. Christ uses um, food as an illustration here um, <clears throat> because he's just got done talking to the Pharisees and they were uh, eating, obviously. And uh, so he uses food as an illustration to, to prove this point. Um, and I love it when Christ talks about food. It kind of gets me like gets me going you know i'm like oh man christ is talking about food here like i'm in like what are you eating uh but it relates to me on a whole new level but what christ is saying here it's not what you eat that what defiles you it's not what you put in your stomach that defiles you that can't change your actions when it, in regards to sin it's the heart that defiles it's the heart that is tied to sin. The Lord's point is that what is defiling within us is already present within every human ever. Ever. That is that you are totally depraved. Totally. That you cannot save yourself by doing this or doing that or by mustering enough strength to do better because your heart is already condemned. That big word depravity literally means that I'm in a hole and I can't get out. It's sinfulness to the core. You are depraved. He is saying that the sin that resides within the depths of our, our own self cannot be surgically removed. It can't be switched up by, oh, I need to do a better diet, or I need to go on hard 75, or whatever, okay? That, that evil that lives within you can't be changed by some sort of action on your own. The sin that resides within the depths of your own self cannot be surgically removed by the actions of self-righteousness. It just can't. This is Ephesians 2, 1, literally what Jerry just read while we were worshiping, saying that we are actually viewed by God as dead in our trespasses, that even though you are very much alive right now, if you are not with Christ, you are dead. That is how evil and depraved your heart and the heart of man is. And that we have to be born again, literally, in a spiritual sense. The condition of our heart before God is not determined by what we eat or by the actions that we do. It is determined when we through it was determined for us that when we through Adam traded the goodness of God, not that Adam, and Adam in Genesis 3 traded the goodness of God for the worthless idol of self. And in doing this, sin entered the world and infected our entirety of life, causing a cosmic chasm, as R.C. Sproul puts it, a cosmic chasm between us and our relationship with God. Church, the greater understanding we have of our depravity, the greater understanding we will have of the grand love that is shown to us by God in the propitiation of Christ. The more we view our sin, the greater we will view the love of Christ given for us on the cross. That's what that means. All these evil things come from within. They come from within you, within me. The good works of mankind do not keep defilement at bay. They don't keep sin at bay. It is at the core of who you are. You are corrupt and in need of correction. And this is what exactly Christ came to do, is to correct. Correct a defiled understanding of depravity and to give you newness of life. This is Romans 6, 4. Write this down. Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might too walk in the newness of life. And we'll, I'll kind of get into this into the application section of this, but know that when you trust in Christ's authority to correct your defilement and depraved heart, we have heaven coming in a newness of life. We are then born again, made new, to glorify him throughout this life and until he returns. But Christ came to correct the defiled understanding of the depravity of man. There is no good within you. There is no good within me. Because out, out of the heart of man comes evil. And lastly, when we have to trust in Christ's authority to correct defiled teachings and, um, and commandments, we have to trust in Christ's authority to correct our defiled understanding of what depravity is. And lastly, Jesus came to correct defiled people who had faith. This is verses 24 through 37. From rebuking the Pharisees and bringing truth about the human state before God, Christ arose, it says, and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidian. If you understand the language here, not even the Hebrew, but if you just look at the language in the Bible, <clears throat> Christ is leaving the region where Judaism resides. He's leaving Galilee, he's leaving Jerusalem, and he's heading into a different land, a different territory. And that's a Gentile territory. If you Googled, <clears throat> in biblical times, is the region of Tyre and Sidian a Gentile country? The answer would be yes. <laughs> yes, it is. And that Gentile territory is looked down by the leaders in Jerusalem. They, it's looked down upon because they are Gentiles and they are not Jewish. And while in this region, he entered a house and could not hide from the crowds. And immediately a woman came to him. In verse 25 and 26. <clears throat> These verses are setting up the answer into how Jesus corrects our defilement. Look at this woman does, look at what this woman does when she hears of Jesus. What's it say? It says, but immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him. And what'd she do? What's that? <laughs> what is it? Yes. Wow. That was, you guys were on point there. He did together. Came and fell down at his feet, right? Only by mirroring just hearing of God, of the Lord, as she later acknowledged him, him as. What is her response? Is that she came and she fell at his feet. And I love how Mark puts in this next verse here because it adds weight to this whole situation. <clears throat> verse 26, it says that now this woman, now the woman was a Gentile, which means she's not Jewish, a Syrophoenician by birth. Don't skip over that. Don't run past that. The heart on this lady is massive. She has a right understanding of who God is, of who Jesus is. What a heart on this lady, not only for her daughter, but toward the king of all kings. If you were a Jewish person following Jesus at this time, you would look at this lady and be like, she is an afterthought. Christ would not even think of doing anything with this lady. She is one, a woman. And in that time, women were um, inferior to men and looked down as upon for that. 
two, she's a Gentile. She is not Jewish. So if you're in this situation, you're like, well, she's a woman with no man around her. Two, she is a Gentile. She's not Jewish. And then three, she is a Syrophoenician by birth. A Syrophoenician is a person that lives in the region of Tyre and Sidian. And the Syrophoenicians were notorious for pagan worship. Now, it doesn't say that she was a Syrophoenician that worshipped a pagan god. It says she's a Syrophoenician by birth. By birth. So people are going to label her as that, but that's not who she is. What she is is a lady who is desperate for her Savior. She falls at Christ's feet, which is a humble state, begs him to cast out a demon from her daughter, acknowledging that he is the only one who can do it. And Christ responds in, in a um, kind of a, a brash manner. It seems brash to us. Look at what he says. This lady falls at his feet, is begging him for, for him to save her daughter, to cast this demon out. And what's Christ's response? He says, let the children be fed first. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, what the heck does that mean? The children are referred to multiple times throughout the Bible as Israel. <clears throat> dogs was kind of like a slang term to use for a Gentile person. Now, it seems brash for Christ to say this. But Christ is perfect and holy and does nothing wrong. He is sinless. So what he is doing is he is testing this woman's faith. Will you continue to follow after me even if I press you a little bit? Will you continue to fall and beg if I press you a little? And she answered him in a faithful way. She says, yes, Lord, capital L, lowercase r, lowercase r, capital L, lowercase o, lowercase r, lowercase d. That's the Hebrew word for Adonai, which is king. She acknowledged that this man is the son of God and that he has, she has nowhere to go except to him. <clears throat> and he answers for this statement you may go you may go your way the demon has left your daughter and she went home and found the child laying in bed and the demon gone <laughs> so Christ in this story heals the um, woman's daughter just by his words just by his words and in the next story, we're going to see a little bit different way Jesus responds to a faithful beg. <clears throat> it says, similarly to this story, um, he returned to the region of Tyre and went through Sidian to the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hands on him. Again, you see another person approaching Christ on the behalf of another, begging for his salvation, begging for healing. Christ returned, a deaf man who had a speech impediment was brought to him, most likely by his friends of the deaf man, and they begged Christ to heal him and to lay hands on him. But what does Christ do? He takes him aside says it right there in your Bible. He takes, he, takes, uh, he takes him aside from the crowd privately. Yes, he takes him aside, away from the crowd privately. Now, remember, this guy is not blind. He is just deaf, and he has a speech impediment. So he can see all that's going on. He just can't hear it. And he can't respond. But Jesus takes him aside privately. He puts his finger into his ear, and after spitting, touched his tongue. 
He looked up to heaven and he sighed. He sighed. They didn't have sign language back then. Language, the sign language, um, and Robert, you can correct me if I'm wrong too, but um, I Googled when sign language, like the actual language itself was invented, and it wasn't until the 17th century. And is that correct, Robert? Yep. And so during this time, he didn't have a language to communicate, but he had to trust that God, that this man was going to heal him. And you know how un uncomfortable it is? I don't know if everybody, somebody gave you a wet willy before. If somebody put their finger in your ear, it is uncomfortable. It is not fun, okay? But this, but Christ puts his finger in this man's ear and then spits and touches this guy's tongue, looks up at heaven and sighs. These are verbs, action verbs to show this man that he is about to do something. And instead of getting up and running away from this guy, you know what this man does? He sits there and lets Christ do it. You know what that is? It's faith. That is faith. Even, even for a man who can't hear and can't speak, he would understand that this man is about to do something to him and he's going to let him do it. He himself has to have faith that even though I do not understand, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to let you be my savior. I'm going to let you heal me. In verse 33 through 34, he does. He prays to the Lord. He prays to God the Father saying, Ephrathah, which is be opened. And immediately, immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And then he charges him to tell nobody. But, oh man, if I was in his spot, what do you think my reaction or your reaction would be? It would be to proclaim that, man, this guy just saved me. All the more zealously. Obviously, we just talked about in the coming weeks that Christ is saying this to, to um, kind of shadow his, his coming to the resurrection or to the death in his resurrection. Because um, at the right time, it will be review, revealed. And so Christ is preparing for that moment. But nonetheless, the reaction of the guy being saved is like, man, this is crazy. And look at the reaction of the people. What's it say? Look in your Bibles. What's it say? Verse 37. It says that they were astonished. Astonished. I was talking to a good friend this week about this, and I didn't know that in Jewish culture, it was known that healing the deaf and the mute and casting out demons is a um, characteristic only given to the Messiah. Only giving to the Lord. He is the only one that can do that. And I'm thinking to myself, why were these guys astonished here and not the past two years that Christ has been doing stuff? It's because in this moment, Jesus is claiming in his deed that he is the Messiah. That only he can do this. Only he can. It would take only a miracle of God to render these people, to heal them. And God did it. <clears throat> you know, in this section, Christ uses the, the table as an illustration to what we as saints need to be doing in order to receive correction for our defilement. He uses the table and the dog, okay? When crumbs that are given to the children are spread out on the ground or fall on the ground, what is the dog's reaction usually? I have a dog. If you have a dog, you would understand. If a dog sees food that falls on the ground, what is he going to do? Uh, he's going to go after it, right? He's going to be like, I'm there. Okay, a piece of salami rolled on the ground, that's mine. Okay. He, there's no wait. There's no hesitation. There's no, oh, man, I'm not good enough to come to Christ just yet. No, there. 
It's the same way with you and me. It's the same way we need to approach Christ. We are defiled. We are broken. There is no way to the Savior except through Jesus. And we got to go to him just like that dog. Just like this lady. Just like the man who is deaf. Lord, I don't understand what you're doing, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust that you have the authority to correct my defilement, my sin, my trial, my brokenness. It is no different with us saints. Humility to come to the Lord and have faith that he is the only one who can correct. He is the only one who can restore. He is the only one who can bring deliverance. There's no other way. It is by faith in the saving mercies of God that those who are outcasts are made family. Demons themselves have to obey the king of kings and flee. And those who are deaf and have physical ailments are made new. This chapter brings to light that true defilement is not our ailments or our circumstances or anything on the outside. True defilement lies with inside and it can only be corrected by Jesus. Amen. We are broken people with no hope of salvation apart from Jesus. <clears throat> so in closing, we covered a lot. I know. I'd encourage you to go back through this, to read it this week, to pray through it this week. I pray that you can see it as I have. That a correction to our problems in this life isn't putting on a face to look better or be more holy in front of other people. That's not going to correct our defilement. That's a miscued teaching and commandment. Jesus corrected the defilement of teachings and commandments that, so that our sin can be exposed and our need for a Savior is, is seen. I pray that you would understand that the correction to our problem is not thinking that defilement is on the outside. That, oh man, the situation I'm in in life is the reason why life sucks, okay? No. Defilement comes from within. It's not from the outside. It is within. Start by looking at yourself in the mirror and seeing what needs correction. I'm not perfect, you're not either. There is something that you can come to Christ with. Jesus came to correct the understanding of defilement and depravity. The greater we understand our depravities, the greater that we understand the cost of what Christ did for us on the cross. And lastly, the correction to our problems is not by thinking we can save ourselves through good works or mustering up enough strength to do better, but it's coming to Jesus, falling flat on our face, begging him to save, to heal. And knowing full well that he has. He has. Read, go on and read the rest of Mark. Go ahead, read ahead. See what Christ did for you on the cross and be amazed by it. Luke 5.31 says that Christ did not come to he, uh, for the uh, healthy or for those who do not need a physician, but Christ came for those who are sick. And that's everyone in this room. True correction to our lives comes by acknowledging that you are indeed depraved, that there is sin that resides within the core of who you are, and we need to fall flat on our face before Christ, begging him to forgive, begging him to restore us, begging him to mature us in faith. This isn't just for people in the room that don't know Christ. This is for everyone in here. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you should be encouraged by this because this is what's going to mature you, the gospel of God. He took our punishment. He took our wrath so that we could be born again by the Spirit and in doing so have new longings for what pleases God and not our flesh. <clears throat> and I want to finish by saying that Christ is, is coming to Christ is both a personal and a corporate thing, church. You do this personally and you do this with other people, specifically in this body. Gentile woman and the man who was deaf were healed because of the begging of another before, before, before them. The woman of the daughter, the woman whose daughter had the demon, she begged on behalf of her daughter. 
The deaf man, his friends begged for Christ to heal him on behalf of the deaf man. Church, you have a play and a part to beg for the person next to you right now that Christ would restore them, that Christ would heal them, that Christ would bring about a healing in their marriage, a healing in their life, a healing in their situation. Don't think that you're just going to be restored if you, if you don't need anybody around you to get into your stuff. That's not how the deaf man was healed. That's not how the daughter's demon was, was uh, cast out. But it's going to be us by coming to Christ as a church personally and corporately pleading that he would heal us, that he would mature us in faith, and that he'd be glorified in this body. That's what we long for. That's what I long for. And I know that's what the church longs for. So surround one another. Go to those resources. Pick them up. Pick up the greatest resource right here. And don't shrug off the opportunity to allow others in your life to beg to Christ on your behalf and walk with you through your ailments. Because trusting in Christ's authority is going to correct everything. It's going to be made new at the end of all things, church. He's coming back, and the newness of life is coming. And that correction starts now with how we come to Christ, fall at his feet, and beg. Let's do that now.